Welcome to the Bolstered Up Sports Podcast. I'm Brian Bolster. Please follow me on Instagram at bolstered underscore up underscore sports and on Twitter at BS underscore takes. Please share, rate, review, and subscribe. I appreciate all of the support. Today, I've got another great episode on deck, part two of the Father's Day special series. I bring in my uncle to talk a whole lot of L.A. sports, the benefits of sports in a young person's life, and we share a lot of laughs along the way. Hope you all enjoy Hey, Uncle Miguel, I appreciate you joining. How are you doing? Oh, good. Good, Brian. Thanks for having me on. Again, I appreciate you coming on. Father's Day is important, and you're my uncle, and I don't know where I'd be without all those donkey bites and, and pig's feet. So, again, an important male role model in my life, but I appreciate it. Oh, no, man, it's a blast. I, thank you very much. You're like a son of me, Brian, so... I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So before we get too much into the Father's Day stuff, I wanted to go ahead and ask you about your Denver Broncos. There's a lot of hype about them this off season. Drew Locke yeah. played well down the stretch. Do you think the Broncos are a legitimate playoff contender this year? You know what? I mean, I'm not as optimistic as everybody because we have such a small sample from Drew Locke. And though, even though you look at all the different players that they have, you look at their offense and the players they picked up and Jerry Judy, and they made some improvements. I mean, they picked up the running back from the Chargers. I still think that they're not going to be more than a than a nine and seven team. You know. I mean, the Kansas City is is going to be really good. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the um, how the Chargers uh, do, but I, I'm not as high. I, I, I'm keeping my expectations, you know, tempered. You know, so <laughs> yeah, I I agree with you. I think the O line is a question mark, and then like you were bringing up, that division is going to be pretty tough. And I think even a good team. We'll go maybe nine and seven in that division. If Derek Carr bounces back, if Tyrod Taylor can give the Chargers competent quarterback play, and then really if Pat Mahomes can stay healthy. Those are three other good teams in your division and that's gonna to be tough. I know, I know. It is gonna to be tough, you know, but I, I think it'll be a victory if they have a, a winning record, you know, because that means that uh, uh hopefully there was some stability at the quarterback position. Hopefully Drew Locke can, you know, uh, have a solid year. I mean, he's still a young kid, but I mean, I think everybody really liked what they saw. I mean, he definitely has got a little bit of fire in him. He gets everybody excited. He's got that youth, you know, and, and he's got a young team around him on offense. So, I mean, I think they have good building blocks, but like you said, they still need help on O-line. I'm just still not that crazy about the coach too, though. I'm just, you know, uh, just wonder if he's a better defensive coordinator than he is a head coach, but I know it was only one year, but uh, we'll have to see. We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, with Vic Fangio, they definitely zagged when everybody was zigging. Everybody was oh, yeah. going young offensive coach, and they went old school defense. So it'll be oh, interesting yeah. to see how it turns out. Yeah. Um, I know you're a big baseball guy, particularly the Dodgers, and there's so much in question about baseball even having a season this year do you have much faith that the league the owners will end up completing a deal and we'll have a 2020 season i mean i i think we will end up having one just because it'll be detrimental to baseball not to have a season to be the only sport that didn't have a season it's just been really disappointing because i really thought that they could come to terms to something a lot sooner but it just seems they're now you know i think i read a number that basically they're just fighting over like a few million dollars in difference and like revenue pretty much you know from 60 to 66 games and and before you know it this if they don't get a deal uh soon it's just going to be like a 50 game season like a college season or something and, it, and it's just, you know, I mean, I, I'll take that if I have to, but it's just disappointing that they they couldn't come to something uh, uh, sooner and just, you know, have as much baseball as we can. Because I think the players are definitely ready to come back. And uh, um, I think the owners now are just being a little petty now. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting fight because 
the finance aspect of how it comes together. The players, you know, they're obviously taking pay cuts. They just want prorated pay for the amount of games. From the owner side, basically the more games they play, the more money they'll lose. So they want to shorten it and go ahead and get to the playoffs and make some TV money. But I think you're right. I think they missed an opportunity to have a season, extended season, and particularly take advantages of at least a potential play during the summer where there's not much else going on, at least in July. I mean, again, the curveball is always coronavirus nowadays. Who knows how that's really going to play out? And I know there's been some positive tests in spring trainings for different teams. So it, that's exactly. always going to be the thing that you can't predict. But it would be nice if there was a little bit more urgency to get it done. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I hope we get to see the games, you know. It, it's just kind of weird. I, I've been trying to, like, in the mornings, uh, uh, I watch ESPN before work, and I've been trying to catch some of the Korean baseball, but I just can't get into it, man. It's just like, <laughs> you know, I mean, I love baseball, but then it's just like I, I just can't get into the Korean baseball. I don't know any of the players, any of the history or anything, so – so I just want MLB back, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's, definitely. Let's cross our fingers and hope. If if they do, if everything comes together, we're gonna have an epic fall season of sports with again yeah. the potential of having basketball, football, and baseball all right during the that fall season, awesome. as well as college football, and it it will be awesome to see. But again, then you have each of them fighting for that TV time and for viewership. Yeah. And um, again, baseball might suffer with that, but we'll just I mean, have I, to see. I, I, not to go off track a little bit, but I was watching, I think ESPN and they were discussing how the NBA is wanting to propose, but the players might be against it, but they've always wanted their season to maybe start off around Christmas and go into uh, through the summer because they don't like competing with uh, football. I mean, cause the NFL basically draws everyone, you know, and so they've always kind of wanted to start their seasons later, but the players are the ones who are just kind of like, no, the summers, they like their summers off, you know. But who knows, you know, uh, they might be forced to get some kind of delay. So interesting uh, world we're living in, but I just hope we get sports back. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> really with you. Do. I'm with you. So let's let's take just a little bit of a step back and go back to your first sports memories and really what got you to be such an avid sports fan and particularly what role did your father play in introducing you to sports and starting up that passion the earliest memories that i have as a child are of me playing sports with my dad i mean my mom's got a picture i have it too i'm like two years old and i'm holding a bat and uh, and a baseball. My dad wanted me to play baseball, you know, uh, since I was born, you know. So I, you know, I've, I've always had a glove as long as I could remember. So, you know, playing catch with my dad, he, even like uh, playing basketball with him. And you know, I was originally uh, born in in Mexico, and I remember as a little kid, we lived in northern Mexico, where like Fernando Valenzuela is from, and like baseball is big there. It's bigger than uh, than uh, than soccer. And there's a winter league there. So a lot of, back then, a lot of U.S. players used to play in the winter league. It was kind of like, uh, uh, something to go play. The players that were on the edge or who were like, uh, second stringers would go play in the, in the winter league to get some sk- their skills home. And so we used to, uh, the city we lived in, um, had a winter league team where there were a lot of American players. And I remember my dad taking me, I was like four, four years old, taking me to baseball games and learning about baseball. So watching live baseball, you know, when I was four or five years old, I mean, I, I still remember in the evening, but it was still like 80, 85 degrees and we're watching baseball. And uh, yeah, I mean, that that's uh, the earliest and probably the fondest memories I have is just like sharing sports with my dad. Yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's, it's really cool to see how people's relationships help spark and stoke that fire and passion for sports and once you kind of cling on to a team or a sport it's tough to let go i mean those bonds are pretty 
a pretty strong. And so you mentioned Fernando Valenzuela. Is, would he be the the specific player that you think that you were really excited to watch and attracted to as as a young kid? Well, you know, I, I, I was um, Fernando Valenzuela came in the '80s where I was a teenager. So I'd have to say when I was a kid, the first uh, uh, Dodger game I ever went to was in 1975. I remember it was against the Atlanta Braves. And uh, um, I think that was the year that Hank Aaron was uh, going to beat uh, Babe Ruth's record. But back then, you know, the players that the Dodgers had were like Steve Garvey, you know, Ron Stay, Bill Russell, Steve Yeager. And I, I used to like Steve Garvey, even though, like, people used to think he was fake or whatever. You know, uh, first baseman Steve Garvey, I, re- I really liked him a lot. Uh, Reggie Smith in right field, too, uh, was really good. I mean, they had some great teams. Back then, baseball didn't have free agents like, like they do now, you know, where you can kind of get like, like a hired gun. You know, every every player came through the farm system. They played together. So actually, you know, uh, just watching those Dodgers, you know, from the 70s that that battled the the big red machine, you know, the, the Cincinnati Reds. Those are my fondest memories. And not so much any particular player, but just that whole team, you know, between Jaeger, Garvey, say, Reggie Smith, and Dusty Baker came in and stuff. So, I mean, just, you know, that that's like my all-time favorite Dodger team. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah, you could tell it was, it was important to you remember all those names still and the positions. So that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. What did sports mean to you as a young athlete? And was there a particular sport that was your favorite to play? Oh, no, uh, definitely baseball. Uh, Baseball um, uh, was always my favorite. I mean, I played uh, other sports, uh, um, but but mainly just baseball. I mean, just the love of baseball that my my dad passed on to me. My dad played baseball as as a young kid in, in high school and you know, I think he was even recruited by the Chicago Cubs too to to play for their minor league uh, system, and and so like he he, he always played uh, um, with me. He even like volunteered to to be my little league coach. I remember he was my little league coach for two years. Uh, what, what I liked about baseball is that um, it was a team effort. But then I liked being pitcher because even though it was a team effort, being a pitcher. It, it was you against the other team in a way, you know, and I really, really liked that. Even though, I mean, I, I say I liked it, but I, I'd always like throw up before a game or something, you know, I was always so nervous, but I just really, just really love that challenge. I love the fact that, you know, I played in a team sport, but then I played a position where, you know, I could either win or lose the game for my team. Yes. The competition within the competition. And definitely, I mean, exactly. I know myself, I really enjoyed pitching, but then mainly played catcher. And again, even though it's a team sport, it is made up of individuals more so than maybe yeah. football. And if you're that pitcher or catcher, you are far more involved in the game than just your oh, yeah. typical players in the outfield or infield. So there's an extra oh, yeah. experience to the game if you get to be one of those two positions. Most definitely, most definitely. I agree. (laughs) Did becoming a father change your perspective on sports and the the role they can play in a young person's life? In a way, I mean, I I think like, like, you know, our daughter Sarah, um, you know, we got her into swimming. And I always, you know, liked that sports taught you discipline. It made you go out there and, first of all, be part of a team. Work hard, practice, practice even when you don't feel like it. Even go out and compete on days where you don't feel like it. Um, I could remember thinking, going and playing, and and just, I don't know if this ever happened to you, but just thinking like you're off, like there's something off, and you feel like you may not have a good game or whatever, but you just pull through it. So um, definitely I think sports, it teaches you discipline, and it makes you work through – past your feelings of maybe not wanting to do something, but have the discipline to just kind of carry it forward and do it, you know. And uh, um, the feeling of accomplishment of just even competing, I think, is just exhilarating. You know, it's addicting. So, yeah, most definitely. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. I definitely think sports provides us so many life lessons, facing fear, 
pushing through yeah. adversity because even if you're you're a great player in any sport, you're going to fail. And I know, again, going back to baseball, you're a Hall of Famer if you fail 70% of the time. So baseball is even more than that as far as oh, facing yeah. fear. When you're standing in the batter's box, even you know as a confident and good hitter, when that ball's coming at 95 to 90, yeah. there's a little bit of fear there. And then yeah, exactly. you have to have a little bit of irrational confidence, which can, which can pay off in some of life's ventures to be in that batter's box. And when you take a step back, you know you're basically going to fail 70% of the time. Yeah. But every yeah. time you step in, you've got to think, well, this is one of the 30%. Like, it, I'm going to get it done this time, even though, obviously, that doesn't quite line up with logic. I, I totally agree. You're so right. I mean, and, and even, like, uh, another thing about baseball, like you're saying, it's a team sport, but individually, you know, you're you're highlighted. You know, every time you go up at bat, you know, it's like your chance right there. You know, all eyes are on you. It's just between you and the pitcher, you know, and the team may be depending on you. There's a guy on base, and it's like the – the, the world becomes silent and, you know, all you can think about is just like seeing the release of that ball and like, you know, making sure you're not swinging too early. You're not getting fooled by a pitch and just making contact, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Especially just the speed of the game really does make yeah. it like the spotlight is on you. It almost feels like things go to slow motion where if other other sports, at least the one, you know, football, basketball, what I played, everything's going so fast and it helps you kind of just move on to the next play as opposed to, you know, yeah, getting just fooled and swinging and missing by three feet and then you have to stand in there and wait another 20 seconds while everybody's just staring at you. You know, that can be tough to handle, but it's what makes it fun at the same time. Definitely, I agree. And so how have sports, and particularly maybe being a fan, impacted your relationship with your father? I think that was like the greatest bond that we had. You know, my, my, my father was not like a, like a very talkative man. So it's not like we ever had like, you know, he was the, the kind of guy who, uh, who would have like chats with me or just, you know... Uh, he was not talkative at all, but like sports was the language that we spoke, you know? Yeah. Uh, if it wasn't for sports, I don't know. I don't know if my dad would talk very much, you know, it's like, uh, he, uh, he had like a one track, two track mind because his first love were, were the Dodgers and the second were the Lakers. So it was like, you know, baseball season, we talked, you know, uh, Dodgers and then Lakers, and then he loved USC football, too. So we watched uh, a lot of college football. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, sports, I think, uh, created a bond with, with, with my father and also just kept it going. You know, I, I, I was lucky enough before I moved from California to work at a company that had season tickets for the Dodgers. And so um, once in a while, I'd be like, hey, Dad, you know, I'll take you to a ball game. You know, it's on me. And they were nice eats, and he was just like, uh, he would just light up, you know. He, he'd sometimes even call me and just ask me, he's like, do you think you can get tickets for this game? I'm like, yeah, let me see what I can do. So almost definitely sports played a huge role in creating this bond and a, and a, and a communication uh, between my father and I, for sure. Yeah, that's really cool, and I, I can relate to that a lot. I know Laurie and my mom have told myself and my dad that <laughs> – we, you know, we don't talk much if it's if it's not sports coming out of our mouth. So I could definitely relate to that, as well as that being a a big part of that relationship and strengthening it, and just yeah, the communication. I would definitely say with my dad, we probably talk ninety percent sports out of all the all the words we say. So yeah, I'm I'm with you with that. And you know, fathers are such a big part of our lives, not only. As young kids, but even now, just the conversations we have, they're so valuable um, and important to us. What does a father mean to you? And maybe speak first on your relationship with your father and then yourself becoming a father. What does that mean to you? Well, you know, my father, he was 
was a, a silent uh, leader at home, you know, like I, like I said, he wasn't a, a very, um, you know, talkative man. He was very passive. My mom was the total opposite. She vocalized everything and very loud. And, you know, I come from a, you know, a loud family, but my dad was always just, you know, at peace and um, hardworking. You know, the lessons that I learned from my dad, not only from sports, it's just like watching him, you know, work. You know, ever since I was a kid, I, I was telling uh, Sarah, my daughter, this uh, not too long ago, um, that I, I, I think I could only remember my dad ever taking one sick day his whole life, you know. And he was always going to work, working hard, uh, providing. Um, he was a great provider. Even if we, you know, it, you know, there was a stretch um, when I was really young where, where we didn't have very much money. But, you know, when you're when you're really young, you, you don't really realize you don't have, you know, uh, your status. Only only when somebody points out the holes uh, in your pants on your knees or whatever. But, you know, um, just the, the discipline that my dad had and, and the, the love for his family in, in terms of working uh, for his family, providing for us. And that's something that, 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 that I took uh, with me because I've worked. Uh, you know, Lisa was a stay-at-home mom for the longest time. And probably about 10, 11 years ago, I got laid off from a company that just totally, you know, rocked my world. But, you know, instead of feeling sorry for myself, I just thought, you know, um, you know, my dad would go out and get two jobs if he had to. And that's what I did at the time. It was just like I, I just did whatever I had to do to provide for my family. And I really owe that to, to the example that my dad, um, like I said, he didn't he didn't say much, but he was just a hard worker provided for his family and you know he just loves sports and you know that's how I am too so you know I, and, and for me as a father I uh, hopefully I've instilled that you know uh, to my daughter which I think uh, you know I have I mean she, she's a, a hard-working girl a very focused I didn't get a chance to like bond with her with sports so much just because it was just not not her thing you know, and I think that's why, like, you know, I, I gravitated to, to you and, and, and Alex, you know, and playing with you guys and talking sports and everything. But um, in, in terms of uh, uh, being a father, you know, I, I, I hopefully I can be half the, the father uh, that my dad was and an example, you know, uh, with my daughter and uh, being this loving man and not even uh, having to vocalize, you know, telling, you know, your family, you love them all the time, but, but showing them with your actions. I think that's uh, one of the biggest things I learned from my father. I'm a firm believer in actions speak louder than words and leading by example can have such a lasting effect on the people that watch you. And that's, that's a really cool story. And, you know, I would definitely say that you are a great example, definitely as an uncle and someone I look up to, definitely. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so on Father's Day, since uh, today is Father's Day, what do you enjoy doing specifically on Father's Day? I, I really just like uh, spending it with the family. This uh, this Father's Day is a little... Uh, uh, a little different just because uh, your Aunt Lisa is, uh, you know, she's a care home caregiver, and she took on a client where she's spending the night over at the client's house to take care of them. Uh, Father's Day here, I just spent it with uh, with a couple of my friends whose uh, whose wife also left left them out of town too, and, uh, and 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 left us together to just celebrate Father's Day together. And of course, Sarah, Sarah's living in another state. She's living in Texas. It was nice, you know. She. She called me. We spoke for a while, so it was a, it, it was nice to to connect. But you know, I mean, definitely Father's Day is about you know. Um, for me, I, I don't even see it so much as a day for me, but I always just reflect on my own dad. So uh, I don't know how it is, uh, you know, with other fathers, but like uh, Father's Day, I, you know, I know I'm a father and everything, but I, I, for me, I, I reflect a lot on my dad. Especially, you know, he he passed away about eight years ago, so. It's a time where I where I spend a lot of time reflecting and just being thankful for, for the father that I had. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, again, for me, not being a father myself, that that is what Father's Day means to me is being thankful, showing appreciation because you yeah. know I know I don't do that enough, but it, it's a time that's it's nice to have a day set aside to yeah. narrow our focus. And, you know, appreciate those who have had such a lasting impact on us. So, 
Let's move back to sports a little bit. As a okay. fan, what has been your most soul-crushing moment? I, I can think of like two different moments, and one of them wasn't uh, game-related, but I think my saddest uh, uh, moment, and, and, and with uh, Kobe uh, uh, dying uh, this year, it kind of brought it back to me, but I, I could still remember vividly when uh, Magic Johnson had his press conference. I was living in L.A. I had just recently been married, and uh, uh, the Lakers held a press conference, and Magic Johnson you know, announced he was retiring because he had HIV. HIV at the time back then, in, in the early 90s, uh, it was basically a death sentence. You know, if people who got HIV B got AIDS, and then they'd wither away and die. And so it was just the most surreal thing because I still remember uh, reporters in L.A. I was sitting on my friend's couch. Uh, uh, we were watching the press conference, and, and I was visiting him that day. And I remember him and I were just, like, crying on the couch. Like, the reporters were crying. The reporters in the studio were crying. And the ones reporting from the uh, press conference, everybody was crying. The Laker players, I remember Michael Cooper was crying like a baby. It was just, like... The, the most you know saddest moment because you just think like if you ask me like who my favorite athlete of all time is it's Magic Johnson that's like my favorite all time athlete I mean I love Magic Johnson he's the man he could never do anything wrong even though he <laughs> kind of blew with the tweets there with uh, <laughs> with Kawhi <laughs> you know I still forgave him because I love Magic but uh, um, yeah and so that that's got to be like my saddest uh, sports related moment. But um, I'd have to say um, when the Dodgers went to the uh, World Series in 77 and 78 and lost back-to-back -back years to the Yankees, that's, that was just soul-crushing. You know, I was, I was a kid, and, I, I, and that's why, you know, even to this day, I, I hate the Yankees. I, mean, it's just, I remember just, you know, how much I suffered watching. I still remember that game with Reggie Jackson hitting three home runs and, one night, you know, and it, it just, I, I cried. I remember I just, I, I, you know, I was the biggest Dodger fan, and to see them go to the World Series two years in a row and lose it, that was just so crushing. <laughs> yeah, the, the losses seem to stick with us almost more than the wins a lot of times and definitely can create strong hatreds that, that never die. And I know, <laughs> for me, there's two, but the one... With the Lakers losing to the Celtics, because, you know, my dad and I know you had, had talked to me a lot about yeah. that rivalry, but really much, there wasn't much of one during my lifetime. The Lakers were really good in that early 2000s stretch, and so I got to see that. And then in 08, and I was a huge Kobe fan. He's probably my favorite NBA player ever. And yeah. they lost to the Celtics, and it was like that game four where – it looked like the Lakers just gave up and they got blown out, and I was just crushed. Now, I will say that yeah. May 2010, pretty awesome, getting some revenge. But, yeah, <laughs> now that loss has stuck with me for sure. Yeah, that was, especially the Celtics, too, you know. I mean, there's just something about the Celtics, too, that, that I hated. I mean, I I remember, you know, just watching the, the Lakers with my dad in the, in the mid-'80s, and, I, I mean, and before they drafted Magic Johnson, it was just Kareem. It was just basically Kareem and maybe Jamal Wilkes. Uh, and then I remember the year they drafted Magic. And, and I still remember um, the first game uh, that Magic played. Uh, they won a, a, on a buzzer beater. And, like, he went up. Magic went up to Kareem and was hugging him. Like, they just won the world champion ship. And Kareem was looking at him like, kid, what are you, what are you doing? You know, get off me. <laughs> That's what I loved about Magic Johnson, just the enthusiasm he brought, and he brought Showtime, and just watching those Laker teams from the 80s, uh, you know, was, uh, was some of my fondest memories. Yeah, so do you have a most exhilarating moment as a fan, or just, you know, best victory that you hold on to? Well, there's two. I mean, I think when the... Uh, when the Lakers finally beat the Celtics, uh, the NBA championship, uh, is one of them. Um, and that was just, I think they beat them at, at Boston Garden, which was the best, you know. Uh, that was one of my most exhilarating moments. But I'd have to say when the Dodgers in 81 
finally beat the Yankees, and that was the year Fernando Valenzuela was playing, and we beat the Yankees. That was just like, you know, take this, Yankees. You know, that was just like, finally, finally, you know. You know, finally we won, you know. I, I'd have to say that was the most exhilarating moment. And there's been some other ones, though. You know, you know, watching the Kirk Gibson home run in, in game one of the World Series against the uh, Oakland A's, I mean, that's that's got to be right up there, too. So uh, definitely some special uh, uh, Los Angeles uh, Dodger moments and Laker moments. Yeah, that's awesome. I know I still can picture – I didn't get to watch it live, but that highlight of the Kirk Gibson home run is going to live on forever. And it's just, it's just, you know, poetry in motion is thrown around too much, but it really is just so iconic with just his style matches the era and he's hobbling and fist pumping. And it's just, it's like perfect fond baseball memory to me at least. Oh yeah, I mean it, it was like um, almost like uh, like a movie scene, like the natural. I mean, I I remember that night vividly. I was uh, dating your aunt Lisa, and we were watching it at your grandmother's apartment, and it was your grandmother Lisa and I watching it right there on the couch, and uh, um, just thinking like, you know, I, I honest, I was just so nervous. I you know. I think uh, it was Bob Costas or somebody was saying like, hey, you know, Kirk Gibson t- is taking swings in the dugout. He might come in. And then they finally bring him in and he's hobbling. And, and it, seriously, it was just like a scene out of the natural. That was just that was just crazy. And then, you know, he won that game. I knew that the Dodgers were going to win the World Series. Cause, and that was the only game he played. He didn't play the rest of the series. But he just, you know, he needed to get that home run, and he set the team straight. And, yeah, that was definitely, definitely an awesome moment. Yeah, it's like a, a miracle. It really is, like you said, it's like a scene out of a movie, which is pretty cool that those things actually happen. But Exactly. I, I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for coming on. Happy Father's Day. Oh, thank you, Brian. It was a pleasure uh, uh, being here. I appreciate the opportunity, and I uh, love listening to your show. So uh, keep at it. You know, uh, you've got some great insights on on what's going on in uh, basketball, football, and you know, sports today. So I'm proud of you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to today's edition of the Bolstered Up Sports Podcast. Please follow me on Instagram at bolstered underscore up underscore sports and on Twitter at BS underscore takes. Please share, rate, review, and subscribe. I appreciate all of the support. I hope you all enjoyed the Father's Day special episodes as much as I did. Fathers play such a big role in the lives of young people, helping us mature, teaching us so many life lessons and sports help us all come together and strengthen relationships. I've got a lot of great content coming up, so y'all make sure to stay tuned. Thank you very much.